two American congresswomen banned from Israel. The Israeli government now saying Representative Rashida Tlaib can visit family in the West Bank. But tonight, why she says she won't go. Plus, President Trump rallies his base in New Hampshire. The latest on his bid for re-election in 2020. And the battle over abortion in America. We head to Texas to hear how one clinic providing health care for adults can save babies. All this and more tonight on Faith Nation. Israel opens the door and a banned U.S. lawmaker slams it shut. Welcome to Faith Nation. I'm John Jessup. And I'm Jenna Browder. For a second day, all eyes are on Israel. The controversy over banning two congresswomen continuing tonight. CBN News national security correspondent Eric Phillips joins us with the latest in the story's many twists and turns. Eric? Yeah, John and Jenna, there are lots of back and forths here. You will remember yesterday when the Israeli government told Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib they could not visit their country because of their support of U.S. legislation in terms of boycotts. Well, you may also recall that Israeli officials said if Tlaib wanted to visit her Palestinian family in the West Bank, they would consider it if she filed a humanitarian request and promised not to promote a boycott while there. Well, Tlaib did file that request, and that's where the latest drama picks up. My goal is to see my grandmother. Um, you know, again, she's in her 90s. This could be my last chance to see her. Those were the words spoken by Rashida Tlaib Thursday after she and Representative Ilhan Omar were officially banned from Israel. And it was presumably a desire to see her grandmother that moved Tlaib to file a request for a humanitarian visit under the no boycott condition. The request was granted in less than 24 hours. The Israel interior minister tweeting, I approved her request as a gesture of goodwill on a humanitarian basis. But then Tlaib abruptly rejected it, saying she would not go, tweeting, silencing me and treating me like a criminal is not what my grandmother wants for me. It would kill a piece of me. I have decided that visiting my grandmother under these oppressive conditions stands against everything I believe in, fighting against racism, oppression, and injustice. The interior minister then called the Michigan congresswoman's request provocative, saying it was aimed at bashing the state of Israel. Apparently, her hate for Israel overcomes her love for her grandmother. Eric Metaxas is a nationally known Christian author and syndicated radio host who says this boils down to a matter of respect on behalf of the congresswomen. It's not an us versus them. It's about respecting the sovereignty of, of Israel. Um, from their rhetoric, I don't get the impression that they do respect that. And if somebody doesn't respect that, how do you expect uh, that country to simply say, oh, yeah, come, come on in uh, and do us harm? You will remember President Trump sent out a very powerful tweet before the Israeli government made the decision to ban the two congresswomen. Well, Metaxas says he believes it was appropriate for the president to send that tweet urging Israel to ban them because he says Omar and Tlaib's statements have been damaging and that anti-Semitism is real and needs to be called out wherever it's found. John and Jenna. Thank you, Eric. Well, to election 2020, President Trump continues to talk the economy as a major selling point of his administration. This comes after a week of growing fears of a possible recession. At a campaign rally in New Hampshire Thursday night, Mr. Trump said if he hadn't won in 2016, the market would have crashed. And he claimed that's what will happen if he isn't reelected next year. See, the bottom line is, I know you like me, and this room is a love fest, I know that. But you have no choice but to vote for me because your 401ks, down the tubes, everything's going to be down the tubes. So whether you love me or hate me, you got to vote for me. And after a week of ups and downs, the market ended up today. The Dow Jones Industrial Average was up 300 points and the S&P 500 closed up 41 points. Well, a potential win for religious freedom, some faith-based groups that receive federal dollars may soon be allowed to be more selective in who they hire. CBN White House correspondent Ben Kennedy explains. This move walks back President Obama's non-discrimination policies. It's also likely to face legal challenges in the courts. President Trump's new proposal aims to give religious groups the broadest protection permitted by law. 
The Department of Labor says the proposal helps to ensure the civil rights of religious employers are protected as people of faith with deeply held religious beliefs are making decisions on whether to participate in federal contracting. They deserve clear understanding of their obligations and protections under law. Reverend Franklin Graham applauded the president's move, tweeting, Christian organizations shouldn't be forced to hire individuals whose beliefs are not aligned with theirs. It wouldn't work. We need to pray for our leaders in Washington and thank God for those who are defending our religious freedoms in this country. Eric Metaxas, author of Donald Build the Wall, adds the government shouldn't be meddling in the hiring process in the first place. The fact that we have these conversations is honestly a measure of, of how insane politics in America has become. If you are in a faith-based organization, whether that's Muslim, Jewish, whatever it is, the idea that you would be forced by the government uh, to hire people who fundamentally disagree with you is madness. But opponents of the measure call it a license to discriminate. Critics of this proposal say it now allows employers to discriminate. Your thoughts? Um, well, all it, all it does is, is protect, uh, again, these uh, faith-based uh, nonprofits or, uh, or ministries. Uh, it protects their right um, to, to run their organizations according to uh, the, you know, the deeply held convictions uh, that they have. Now, the Labor Department adds that religious organizations will still be bound by state laws and must adhere to protections for workers based on race, sex, and national origin. Ben Kennedy, CBN News, the White House. All right, thank you, Ben. And joining us now is Julia Manchester with The Hill. Julia, good to have you. Thanks good for see stopping you guys. by. Yeah. Uh, you know, this new hiring regarding President Trump, it really points to, or regarding the Labor Department, it points to President Trump's record on religious freedom. How much will religious freedom be, uh, you know, a, le a lasting legacy of his administration? I think it will be a huge part of his administration, especially with um, conservative Christians and evangelicals. You know, President Trump has really been able to drive home his platform on that issue to these voters and, and attracting these voters. I mean, President Trump already has such high approval ratings among, e among evangelicals and conservative Christians. And I think religious freedom, especially for Christians, is something that really speaks to them and what they appreciate that the president is doing. Julia, today the Israeli interior minister uh, responded to Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib's decision not to visit her grandmother, saying apparently her hate for Israel overcomes her love for her grandmother, your thoughts there? Yeah, quite a heat, uh, quite a controversial, heated scenario really playing out between these two parties. I mean, Rashida Tlaib said she didn't want to visit her grandmother, who was in her 90s, under these conditions where that she characterized as oppressive. Clearly, there are very, two sides to this issue, and tensions are very high. But I think this really speaks to President Trump's role in all of this. Hmm. It is a bit unprecedented that. He is ordering another nation, an ally of the United States, to block a member of his own Congress from visiting. Um, granted, we have to note that Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar were originally invited to join a bipartisan group last of Congress week. members right. last week to go to Israel, but they instead decided to go on their own, and they faced some criticism for taking part in activities that are tied to the BDS movement or divest in Israel movement. Um, however, you know, this could be, you know, this is something that they have a, you know, they obviously have a freedom of speech, a freedom to do, you know, speak their mind on this issue. However, it's quite controversial. Uh, turning to campaign 2020, uh, you know, Elizabeth Warren, she has surpassed Bernie Sanders now in most in most polls. Uh, what do you make of this, Julia? Where is this race, this primary heading? Yeah, I think it shows that Elizabeth Warren is really getting that progressive vote and she's very much winning in that battle with Bernie Sanders for that vote. Now, Bernie Sanders has said that this isn't in a battle and that he's kind of pivoted and blamed this on the news media for not covering him fairly or maybe some of the other candidates fairly. But I think Elizabeth Warren is simply more appealing to the American electorate as a whole than Bernie Sanders is. She calls herself a capitalist, yet she is very um, progressive. She's been, you know, on the ground in these states laying out these detailed policy proposals. So she just seems more marketable with Democratic voters at this point in the mainstream and the progressive.
progressive um, wing of the party than Bernie Sanders We is. have less than a half minute, but I want to squeeze in Greenland. What do you make the president potentially looking to buy the country of Greenland? Yeah, I didn't think we'd been ta be talking about this today. This is something that's been floated before, such in World War II, but maybe not in as stark of terms. But we know that Greenland is very much saying it's not for sale. All right. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Julia Manchester with The Hill. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Julia. Well, coming up, how talks with the Taliban are bringing Afghanistan one step closer to peace. Wouldn't it be great if you could just hop on a plane and fly to a third world country and hand out food and medicine to the needy? And wouldn't it be great if some of those people came to know Jesus as their savior because of your help? And wouldn't it be great if you could help out people like this all around the world every day? Wouldn't that make you feel great? And what if you could do all of this without having to leave your home or write monthly checks? Well, you can. Partner with CBN and you can help spread the gospel all around the world and make it a better place. And when you sign up for Pledge Express, your contribution will be deducted from your bank account every month automatically. It's a safe and simple way to make a difference. Plus, wouldn't it be great to get life-changing teachings every month from Pat and Gordon? When you sign up for Pledge Express, you'll save time and money. And you won't just sit around and watch the world go by. You'll help change it for the glory of God. Now, wouldn't that be great? When you care, souls are set free. When you give, lives are made new. When you share, Eternal life begins. When we all come together to love, miracles happen. President Trump is meeting with his cabinet to map out a plan for withdrawing American troops from Afghanistan. The meeting comes as recent talks with the Taliban are pushing the country closer to peace, ending an 18-year war. But with rising violence and presidential elections just weeks away, no one knows what Afghanistan will look like by the end of the year. Chuck Holton reports from Kabul. This Afghan street market in the capital city of Kabul is bustling after Friday prayers. But there's a tension in the air anytime large groups of people are found in one place. The threat of suicide bombers is at an all-time high and are now an almost daily occurrence. In late July, the city suffered three car bombs in one day. Abdul Muhammad was nearby for one of them. I was doing my duty inside our compound. I heard an explosion and I came out. I saw a couple of wounded victims on the ground near our office and over there. The target was two vehicles, but I don't know who was inside the vehicles. Donald Trump says he's tired of hearing that the United States is losing the war in Afghanistan. And he says the American people feel the same way. And that's why the U.S. military has been having talks with our enemies, the Taliban, here in Afghanistan to try to come up with a ceasefire. But even while they're doing that, the Taliban has been stepping up attacks around Kabul, like the one that happened right here in front of Kabul University in mid-July. They killed more than 10 people. But if we've learned anything from the precipitous pullout that happened in 2011 in Iraq, it's that if we pull out too soon or in the wrong way, it could have serious consequences for the United States in the future. Over 17,000 coalition troops are still in the country, but their role has changed dramatically from direct action to one that's more focused on advise and assist. This means Afghan troops are doing the lion's share of the fighting and dying as well. While the U.S. has lost 12 soldiers this year, the Afghans regularly suffer over 100 soldiers killed in action in an average week. Another contributing factor to the uptick in violence we're seeing across Afghanistan right now are the upcoming presidential elections at the end of September. Back in July, there was a massive complex attack at this building behind me, which were the offices of the president's running mate, Ashraf Ghani, the president of Afghanistan, the incumbent. 
And it just shows that the Taliban is flexing its muscles in advance of that upcoming election. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said in August that the solutions to Afghanistan's problems are diplomatic, not military, and that the U.S. is committed to working with the Afghan government to finally extricate our forces from the country. President Trump has made very clear uh, that his desire is that we uh, develop a uh, diplomatic resolution that permits us to reduce the resources that are located there in country while simultaneously ensuring uh, that Afghanistan never again becomes a platform where a terror can strike the United States of America. Despite the recent increases in violence, things have gotten better in Afghanistan since I started coming here, at least back in 2007, 2008. You can look at factors like the infant mortality rate, which has gone way down. Gross domestic product is five times what it used to be. And life expectancy, which was only 43 years, is now in the mid-60s. So things are getting better, but the concern is that if the U.S. leaves precipitously, it could cause a lot of those gains to be reversed. But for the shoppers in this Afghan market, the best future they can hope for right now is to simply make it home to their families for one more day. From Kabul, Afghanistan, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. Coming up, how the full-service model of one pro-life clinic in Texas is helping hundreds to choose life. I am region's first ROTC graduate student. When you give, smiles grow bigger. When you care, homes are happier. When you comfort, the hurt goes away. When we all come together to love, miracles happen. Well, welcome back. In states across America, pro-life groups are pursuing a strategy to end abortion. They are passing laws aimed at going all the way to the Supreme Court and hoping to convince the justices to overturn the ruling that legalized abortion. But in Texas, the state where Roe v. Wade originated, a medical clinic is using a different approach to save babies. Jennifer Wishon explains. 9.30 in San Antonio, and it's already hot. In order to appreciate the power of Christ, these women are getting ready for their day. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Our sin caused a rift between us and him. So great is the holiness of our God. They worship and praise. We finished uh, abortion recovery with Angela and she, she's healed. Preparing them for a calendar full of chances to save lives. Well, let's get after it. They give the day to God. We pray, oh God, that she will keep her divine appointment at one, that she would see that this is a child and not a product of conception, and that she will give this child life. Father, we pray for life for this child. Amen. Amen. 
It's a daily ritual here at Life Choices Medical Clinic, a place where these professionals never know what needs they'll be asked to meet. Sometimes it's practical, sometimes it's spiritual, sometimes it's emotional. It's kind of diaper central. It was intended to be our education room. When Charity Farrar started at the clinic nearly 10 years ago, she says it was great at handing out diapers. From the front door, they come up this hall, and this is the staging area. But when they started offering medical services to women, and eventually men, their influence multiplied. This room here is our ultrasound room. I love this room. It's my favorite room probably in the whole building. God does amazing things in this room. Here at Life Choices Medical Clinic, women can get a pregnancy test, get a free ultrasound to see pictures of their baby, get prenatal care and counseling, all within a few steps down this hallway. Our goal really as the clinic is to make sure that they know they're fully supported throughout their pregnancy. That's sometimes a big help if they're choosing between life and termination, knowing that they have that continuity of care gives them a secure feeling. They even offer testing and treatment for sexually transmitted diseases. If they're here for STI testing and treatment, then we talk to them about that. And what are their risks and the exposure that they have? And what can we do to prevent that? And, oh, by the way, what does God say about all of this? Ellen Leone has honed her skill of discernment. This afternoon, she gets the chance to show that abortion-minded mom pictures of her baby. It's really just letting God take over in the moment, too, because, you know, he's active in the room and just seeing the Holy Spirit move there move their hearts is just a, it's a blessing to see. This clinic and hundreds of others across the country are proving critics wrong, who say pro-life activists stop caring about women after they choose life for their babies. Life Choices support some moms until their children reach kindergarten. And last year, the clinic witnessed nearly 120. Oh, these are brown. Brown and blue. Professions of faith. We love it when our patients ask us if they can have a Bible. Our number one mission is to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Everything else is secondary to presenting the gospel. My personal philosophy is that if we save the mother eternally, we save that baby because the mom has a change of heart. It's wonderful being in that we have the freedom to share our faith. It's not by any means coercive or, or anything that we do there, but where we can live like human to human and really connect with patients. And now Farrar wants to take this so hopeful model across live. Texas. Working with four other organizations, Life Choices aims to serve 100,000 women and save 10,000 babies in just five years. Uh, abortion started in Texas. We want to end it in Texas. Abortion is an atrocity. Abortion is not health care. It's not health care for the mother and certainly not health care for the child. But life, Jesus came that we might have life and have life abundantly. That starts now. So what about that abortion-minded mom Farrar and her staff prayed for? After her appointment, she decided to keep her baby. Folks at this clinic have learned the more contact they have with a woman, the more likely she is to keep her baby, and the better equipped she is for motherhood. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, San Antonio. The journey home still ahead why people from all over the world are packing up and making the move to Israel. Olam. This is our nature as a country. To make the world a better place. Literally, we felt the earth shaking. The Christian Broadcasting Network presents to life how Israeli volunteers are changing the world. This film needs to be seen by everyone. I was in tears. Now you can own the inspiring documentary to life on DVD. There is blood on our hands if we know and we walk away. I'm so grateful that this film was made. To life can be yours for a gift of $10 or more. Call 1-800-700-7000 or log on to CBN.com. We know that every minute counts to save life. It'll uh, bless Israel, but it'll also bless all the friends of Israel. Discover the untold story of how Israeli volunteers are making the world a better place. Call 1-800-700-7000 or log on to CBN.com to get your copy today. I am 
region's first ROTC graduate student. Well, nearly 250 new immigrants arrived in Israel this week. Many see their arrival as a prophetic fulfillment. They point back to when God said he would gather his people to the promised land from the four corners of the world. Chris Mitchell has a story from Israel. After a 10-hour flight, with some waiting and planning the trip for years, these Olim, or new immigrants, set foot on the promised land. The arrivals come from 22 states, two Canadian provinces, and include 103 children, three sets of twins, and a 28-day-old baby. This is a, a, a great uh, situation for the state of Israel that 240 Jews from North America arrive in Israel here, and we are very proud to have them as students, as soldiers, as partners in the state of Israel. Nefesh Benefesh organized this arrival, a milestone for the organization. 60,000 Olim, our 60th charter flight. It's as glorious as the first flight, seeing people fulfill their dreams, coming home. It's remarkable. The first time, the first person is just as important and just as exciting as the 60,000th person right now. This brother and sister reunited after two years. I don't know, I'm overjoyed like it's so weird, I've been here like alone and now I have my brother, it's amazing. And families made the journey. It's just one of the most amazing feelings in the world to be able to come to our homeland, to uh, be part of the state of Israel, the Jewish homeland that we've always uh, dreamed of being a part of. Is this a dream come true? Absolutely, absolutely. We are living the dream. <laughs> David is the nephew of Yekiel Ekstein, who brought thousands of Jews to the land of Israel and passed away recently. Beryl is Yaquil's brother. I miss my brother being here, but he's here. And I know that he would have been the first one to greet David. He loved him so much. For the Yeksteins and many other families making Aliyah, it's about the generations. We're so proud of them to make this decision at this stage in their life to come back home where my father was born, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, and now this generation's coming home. It's also about the Bible coming to life. It's about the ingathering of the exiles, bringing the Jewish people home. But it's not even for me, it's not even because of the fulfillment of prophecies that I'm so happy. It's because my family is coming home and we're all together finally. And when we're all together in our land, that brings the most light to the whole world. For these new arrivals, the Israel adventure is just beginning. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, David Ben-Gurion Airport, Tel Aviv. And for more from Chris Mitchell and the CBN News team in the Middle East, make sure you check out Jerusalem Dateline. You'll find it on the CBN News Channel every Friday night beginning at 9.30 Eastern. For more info, visit CBNNewsChannel.com. Jenna, you know Chris and his entire team in Jerusalem are just stellar. We say this all the time, but Chris is probably the coolest person who works at CBN. I 100% yeah. agree. Well, thanks for watching Faith Nation tonight. Have a great weekend.